welcome to every everybody. I see there are 43 participants at the moment. Welcome to you, Jean. It gives me tremendous pleasure uh, to, to introduce you um, to, to all of us. Uh, uh, Professor Jean Komarov, currently the Alfred North Whitehead Professor of African and African American Studies and of Anthropology at Harvard University. And um, I think it's safe to say that over the past 40 years or so, she solo or jointly, of course, with, uh, with John, has changed uh, the, the face of anthropology uh, and more generally our way of thinking about the African continent and its place uh, in the world and in the global political economy. Her work has revolutionized Africanist anthropology in more ways than one, starting with her 1985 classic uh, uh, book, seminal book, Body of Power, Spirit of Resistance, a book that I still use uh, in my teaching today, uh, as I do with many other books that most of you are no doubt familiar with, think of the, the volumes of, uh, of Revelation and Revolution, of Ethnography and the Historical Imagination, her 2007 book, um, Beyond the Politics of Bare Life on AIDS in Southern Africa, but also many edited volumes uh, such as Law and Disorder in the Post-Colony, articles such as the 1999 classic uh, on occult economies and other influential texts that offer reflections on millennial capitalism, on youth, on crime, on modernity, on law, on labor, on state formation, ethnicity, and so on, and so on. So this body of work has, I think, forever changed the way in which we conceptualize and theorize post-colonial Africa. And as such, Jean has taught us to think differently about history, about the effects of colonialism and contemporary capitalism, about power, hegemony, body politics, um, subaltern agency, and so on. In this respect, I also want to uh, uh, mention theory from the South or how Euro-America is evolving toward Africa, a book from 2011, a book I think that in many ways forms the, 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 the culminating point of this lifelong engagement to the center our thinking and uh, theorize the world from outside the perspective of uh, the global north. In today's keynote, Jean will be revisiting a theme that uh, those of you who are familiar with her work, and I guess that includes all of us, uh, I would think uh, that you will recognize, and that is a theme of labor, or more precisely, uh, as the title of her text uh, says, after labor. Um, and she will be addressing uh, in her talk today one of our time's fundamental contradictions, uh, namely the fact that in spite of uh, the disappearing of wage and, and salaried mass employment and wage labor, as we have known it, wage labor nevertheless continues to be viewed as the, the telos of, of modern capitalism, let's say, or the presumed norm or life goal in our current time. So, the elections in the United States have, that, have made that clear once more, I guess. Uh, so without further ado, dear Jean, uh, uh, once again, thank you so much for joining us, for accepting to deliver this first keynote uh, in the third Antusia uh, Summer School. The floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Philippe, and it's wonderful to see you again. Um, long years of comradeship in working in and, and supervising students a lot in relation to Africa. And thank you, Lotta, for including me in this. These are the most important forums, I think, that we do, which are intergenerational conversations, because in fact, it's the people who are beginning to do their work now that are leading us forward. And thanks, Tom, for your patience in dealing with my ineptitude uh, in terms of Zoom. So all across the globe, it seems, there is rising anxiety that wage work, as we've long known it, seems to be disappearing. Yet there's little agreement as to why, where, or in what measure, or what might take its place in the future. We, scholars, politicians, pundits, people at large, seem unable to think beyond a universe founded on mass employment. But why not? After all, capital has always been, uh, has tried to free itself as much as possible from a dependency on labor. 
often with notable success. Indeed, it is now widely recognized that people have always been more wageless than wage. But if, if employment has always been threatened by erasure, always more an aspiration than an actuality, why does it remain so central to both popular and theoretical understandings of economy and society, left and right? How might this relate to fears about its imminent end? And more generally, what exactly is unique about this moment in the long history of labor? As we fail to imagine an age after work, we appear to be ever more haunted by the nightmare of our own redundancy, by surreal images of a world in which value is produced by other means, not just by finance or AI or casualized part-timers, but by workers who are at once human and non-human, living and dead, present and absent. Put another way, what finally does all of this tell us about the afterlife of Oma Faber? Answers to these questions, I submit, are greatly enriched by extending our gaze beyond the vantage of Euro-America. I come back to Philippe's point. The hemispheric north may be the traditional source and horizon of so much of our theory, but a comprehensive a grasp of the history of labor and its futures and of global, global capitalism at large has a needs to embrace the entailment of the Euro-modern world in its southern outsides in Africa, Asia, Latin America, the source after all of so much of the animating energy of what, has, was what we have come to call the West and of its most precarious dehumanized forms of toil. It is a history whose Southern past, the North seems to be reliving now, almost perhaps unwittingly. In the late 1990s, zombies began to appear in South African popular discourse. Although foreshadowed in local cultural imaginings, their arrival was both sudden, sudden and unexpected. Yet the timing was not serendipitous. It occurred as the already fragile infrastructure of black life was threatened quite abruptly by a radical shrinking of the job market. There was a cruel irony here. Wage labor was being made superfluous just when decolonization was supposed to put an end to the racial capitalism of apartheid, promising decent, secure, paid work for all. But the transition to democracy coincided with a worldwide wave of neoliberal reform, reversing the advance after World War II of state-managed social welfare, economic regulation and redistribution. In the upshot, post-authoritarian societies like South Africa experienced the moment as an anguished mix of, dis of enfranchisement and dispossession, of rights-based recognition and jobless growth, a politely evasive term this for mass unemployment. It was then that rumors spread about an invading army of surrogate workers. On the one hand, migrants from the North, said to be diseased, desperate, and crime-prone, and ready to toil at cutthroat rates, um, at, at cutthroat rates. On the other, there was a host of beings raised by occult means from the dead, who served in a surging, secretive, nocturnal economy. Together, these interlopers were blamed for the loss of jobs. And so it was that wage work, at once desired and disappeared, present and absent, returned in spectral guise. Zombies, figures who lack the animating qualities of personhood, bodied forth in popular rhetoric, rumor, and media reportage, in legal disputes and industrial conflict. Because they lack human needs, these living dead are pure surplus value. They exist, we were told at the time, by eating away at the lives and livelihoods of others. To be sure, they have been a ghostly presence, what Walter Benjamin called a profane illumination, throughout the history of modernity reappearing at moments of rupture in the prevailing relations of production. As figurations of slavery and colonial extraction, they entered the US vernacular during the occupation of Haiti between 1915 and 1943 to be repurposed by the culture industry as the scientifically animated undead, versatile incarnations of late modern monstrosity, predation and horror. Hence, in our times, our own times of crisis, 
the circulating tropes of zombie banks, zombie corporations, voodoo economics. Tellingly, South Africa's bankrupt electricity company, ESCOM, said to be the world's largest power utility, has been dubbed the zombie apocalypse. No wonder then that when activists staging a public protest last year to reclaim the city of Cape Town for the poor, uh, it came costumed, they came costumed as zombies. As a product of preternatural accumulation, zombies bear uncanny, uncanny resemblance to recent fictional figures of proletarian undoing. Like the Equi Sapiens, half horse, half black man, in Boots Riley's searing movie, Sorry to Bother You. I don't know if that movie has done uh, the circuit in Scandinavia and Europe, but if it hasn't, you should look, look, look for it online. So this film, um, Sorry to Bother You, has, has a, this image of these horse people who are created as laborers. The image recalls a point made about racial capitalism by Hilton White, who was building in turn on Morsh Stone's early analysis of the iconographies of anti-Semitism in Europe. White suggests that if Jews have historically epitomized the racial body of money without labor, blacks are now stereotyped as labor without will, labor in itself, a brute biological force in need of mastery. Boots Riley's horse people are precisely that power, horsepower, in genetically engineered form, half man, half beast, fully exploitable. In the movie, they are the invention of Worry Free, a fictive serv a service uh, corporation, um, and makes these mutant workers to be more effective, but cheaper than robots, where they talk about. Now, robots, of course, are the other nemesis of Homer Faber. A new study titled, You Fired, Says the Robot, reports an epidemic in the American workplace of technophobia an anxiety-related syndrome centered obsessionally on robotics and artificial intelligence that are coming to get one. Not only in America, an anguished op-ed in 2018 by the head of the University of Johannesburg featured a picture of the first humanoid robot in South Africa. White in color, the national flag painted on its chest, it stared calmly into the fearful eyes of its black creator. Like the zombie, the android, a body bereft of life, makes real the fantasy of production without human work. Even in the face of the putative end of wage employment, we remain trapped in this kind of fetishized logic. The android and the zombie alike appear as doppelgangers of living labor, returned, if only to be effaced, a kind of estranged recognition of the unthinkable. Recall here also another movie uh, the, uh, that had the underworld workers, zombie killers in red hats and overalls, that almost robotically invade the urban landscapes. This is Jordan Peele's blockbuster film, Us, or the US. Um, and here, the, the zombie workers make the point in surreal form that it is the commodity economy itself, however apparently benign, that yields redundant workers. Both zombies and androids will reappear as my story unfolds. Speaking of that economy, however, and the role of labor in it, a prior point has to be stressed. It is little more than a cliche to note that the social world under capitalism as an historical formation is constituted primarily by wage work. At the same time, as several theorists have argued, it is a formation with a contradiction at its core. On the one hand, as I've already intimated, it's uh, it, uh, on the one hand, as we have already intimated, its development over time, most recently with globalization, financialization, and the digital revolution, has rendered wage work increasingly anachronistic, increasingly irrelevant to the generation of wealth. Stock markets typically rise when workers are laid off. And yet, on the other hand, that form of labor remains ontologically indispensable to capitalism essential to its self-understanding, its sense of how value is created, which perhaps is why, as wage work is devalued and displaced, it tends to return these days, both in theory and in life, in refigured, dehumanized forms. Hence the zombie, the robot, the mutant, 
each a specter of human toil under erasure. Toil that retains the traces of its original significance, but is rubbed out, as Derrida would say. It's both there and it's erased. This paradox that labor is integral to social being, yet is undone by the historical conditions under which our world has evolved, is, I would suggest, critical for making sense of contemporary debates about the future of work. Modernist conceptions of labor, not coincidentally, emphasize this, inter this counterpoint of indispensability and irrelevance. These conceptions draw on a submerged, the submerged theological roots of liberal thought, in, in which work is the defining attribute of species being, of the capacity to transcend nature, to acquire property, to make history, to reach for the gods. Foucault recall, recall spoke explicitly of the sacred powers of work, its universal necessity. Romantics, early and late, have insisted that labor transcends a pure instrumental function. It is artful, it is ethical, it is creative, it is redemptive. Liberal and Marxist thinkers too, even while um, seeing labor at root as productive paid activity, tend also to invest it with dignifying emancipatory potential. But this is in spite of the fact that wage employment has always been, for the most part, coerced, forced, a consequence of dispossession, albeit of different kinds in different times and places. In spite too, of the fact that labor has long been entailed on a system bent on accruing profit, profit by variously dehumanizing work um, um, by more or less exploitative means, which by extension make the idea of unalienated work um, an, an unrealizable ideal, ideal, and a whole set of arguments here, of course, about emancipated labor and whether this is possible. So in, 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 in terms of the vision I'm presenting here, it's an oxymoron. Relevant in this regard as well is the feminist objection that received conceptions of work have remained irredeemably narrow and masculinist, perennially romanticizing domestic activity while ignoring its essential contribution to the generation of wealth and the accretion of social value. Likewise, the observation of critical scholars of racial capitalism, very much a topic on the agenda here in America right now. And the, the, the point they make is that the structural articulation of gender with race has served further to discount both female and racialized labor, thereby providing a kind of double subsidy to commodity production. The corollary is clear. Capital throughout its history has fused multiple modes of extraction, relying, as Rosa Luxemburg insisted, on various and variously violent practices of primitive accumulation, all the while alongside the talk of free labor. Hence, for example, the cloning of hybrid terms very common in the African literature, semi-proletariats, for example, to describe colonial class formation. Um, to, and we'll return to this as well. Hence also the ideological work entailed in defining, classifying, and ascribing relative value or no value at all to various kinds of human activity. Descriptions that mobilize the axes, axes of difference, race, gender, age, and types of work, skilled or unskilled, domestic or productive, to recognize, prioritize, rationalize, and remunerate that activity, or not remunerate it, as the case may be. Self-evidently, then, the commodity economy has always been more diverse, more synth synthetic in its labor regimes than the standing hegemonic narratives are wont to suggest. The more general point, that this historical formation has enacted repeatedly, if in different forms, the contradiction at its core, asserting the centrality of free labor and the forms of accumulation associated with it, while simultaneously undermining it. The proliferation of occupation, skills, and kinds of, of compensation implicated in the restructuring of production since the 1970s plays out much the same contradiction in different keys. The labor routines, flexible contracts, and deregulated modes of accumulation that have emerged in these decades, their uncertainties, precarities, and ruptured temporalities, and I've seen this in the papers that I've read uh, for this meeting about um, what's happening in Africa, they, these things may seem unprecedented, 
In the age of rampant financialization and rising self-employment, they may even seem to have emancipatory possibilities. Hence the celebration in Europe of post-workists of life beyond formal employment and the daily grind of what the late David Graeber called bullshit jobs. Also by those like Hart and Negri or Ulrich Beck, who claim that more fluid, intelligent forms of labor may eventuate in a new kind of commons, a new civility, a new grammar of the multitude. But much of what looked like to be new sorts of occupation actually go back a long way, unremarked and unremunerated, only to be renamed in rebranded guise. The flexibility and casualization associated with what has come to be called neoliberalism merely put a techno-economist gloss on forms of job insecurity, piecework, and underemployment and the scanting of labor protection that has been integral to the age of industry all along. So emerging categories like affective or immaterial labor may acknowledge the feminist demands to recognize the unwaged work of domestic reproduction, but they also tend to sentimentalize that work, as we've noted, replaying the rhetoric that historically has underwritten the confinement of women's activities, the handmaid's toil, to the priceless sphere of the home, i.e. unpaid work. Even when recognized now as bona fide jobs, affective work, caring, hospitality, cleaning, remains the underpaid housework of the public domain. How then is the contradiction at the core of the relationship between capital and labor resolved in these our troubled times? Why do received forms of work rendered anachronistic, redundant, often surplus to requirements, still retain such elemental significance, at least culturally? And why do they keep returning, often in metamorphosed, often spectral guise? How more broadly are we to think an anthropology of labor in our times? And I would say particularly for Africa. A historical parenthesis at this point, courtesy of Thomas Piketty, who reminds us that patterns of inequality have fluctuated visibly over the past century, this in tandem with other economic indices and with the fortunes of labor. After a period of low and slow growth, accompanied by deepening inequality during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, there came a phase post-World War II, during which growth and per capita GDP more than doubled, wages rose significantly, and levels of inequality dropped sharply, only to be followed from the early 1970s onwards by a dramatic reversal. Since 1973 and into the continuing present, growth and GDP have waned. Living standards have fallen for many across the planet. Income back gaps have, wide, have widened greatly and rates of debt have skyrocketed. The optimum middle period from 1945 until the 70s is associated in the archaeology of capital with state-centric Fordism underpinned by a Keynesian ideology of economic management. And by the sanguine optimistic imaginings uh, at least partly realized of a world of full employment, of workers' rights, of comprehensive social welfare and extending the protection of citizens Against, uh, to citizens against joblessness, homelessness, illness, and indigence. A quick look at employment figures in this regard, though as we'll see in a moment, we've got to treat these uh, figures often with skepticism, but a quick look at them is indicative. In the USA, for example, joblessness in the late 1960s was never higher than 3.8%. In the 1980s, in the um, early years of the Reagan administration, as the Fordist era gave way uh, to the neoliberal, it rose to 10.8%. Unlike, um, alike in the UK, whose jobless figures from 1945 to 71 peaked at 2.7%. In 1983, under Margaret Thatcher's Conservative Party, they reached 12.9%. Significantly, the history of trade unions echoes this trend. In 1954, 35% of all American wage workers were union members. That figure fell to 20% in 1983, soon after the attack on labor by the Reagan administration, and it now stands at 
British unions at their height in the 1960s and 70s were also radically, under, um, were radically undermined during the 1980s at the behest of the Thatcher government and its corporate backers. The ironies here are unmistakable. If growth and GDP are taken to be significant indices of material well-being, both the US and the UK were at their healthiest when jobless rates were at their lowest. Unions were at their strongest. Wages were rising and inequality was at its most limited. Of course, any number of contingencies affect fluctuations in employment and inequality. Among them, inflationary cycles, recessionary pressures, market corrections and political upheavals. But my point doesn't lie in the specificity of these numbers. It lies in the fact that they speak, if tacitly, to a historical consciousness that recalls the post-World War II decades uh, with regard to national economies and societies in a particular way. Those decades, the coming of age years of the still powerful bo bo uh, baby boomer generation, those two people who are battling it out today in the US election in the 70s, sustains a paradigmatic presence in the contemporary sociological imagination. This in many ways was the, was the moment at which liberal democratic modernity, as retrospectively remembered, reached its optimistic zenith, at which talk of the great, the great society in its various global northern variants appeared most persuasive, at which promised poverty and insecurity seemed to recede in the face of the norm of lifelong employment, at which the struggle for civil rights and the recognition of difference, most notably in respect of race and gender, seemed to have made permanent advances, at which the global South looked forward to a hopeful future. But hiding in plain sight, just off camera, there looked persisting forms of exclusion, inequality, and raw injustice. In the immiserated US inner cities, for example, and the bleak estates of Northern Ireland, in the poorer reaches of immigrant England, the site of the first xenophobic outbreaks, and in the violent theatres of neo-imperial warfare in Southeast Asia, Africa, and innumerable elsewhere. Some would see in these places and in the penumbra of the Cold War, the possibility of popular struggles against prevailing structures of power. It was the rise of black power movements in the West and the emergence of left-wing um, regimes in many former colonies. At the same time, however, there occurred in counterpoint the resurgence of conservative forces that opposed many forms of welfare statism, like the, U uh, the New Deal in the US um, or in Europe, labor-driven socialism. And they were cast by this new, uh, uh, this rising uh, consciousness as a danger to the freedom of persons and markets and as harbingers of totalitarianism. From the 1970s onwards, those forces were to capture the political center and push ideological orthodoxy in a contrary direction. For its part, business reacted to the gains made by workers' civil, right, um, and, uh, civil rights movements in Euro-America by devising new free trade mechanisms under the program of global restructuring, orienting towards the remaking of supply chains, production, and the organization of work. And so the long dialectical struggle between capital and labor entered its latest chapter. Wherever it could, the former, embodied in ever more sovereign uh, corporate sectors, pushed for privatization, deregulation, casualization, financialization, and uh, a reduced legal liability and policies of austerity at home, and reconfigured, flexibilized, outsourced production abroad in places where workers were more abject, less protected, and often forced into wage slavery of one kind or another. Still, for all the reverses that have occurred since, the post-war conjuncture of 1945 to the 70s continues in critical respects to be the received template against which social expectations tend to be measured, even as the deficit between those expectations and lived reality grows every passing year. And so it remains plausible to speak in the future perfect tense of mass employment and secured salaried work for all, undergirded by the modernist mythos honed in the age in which labor seemed to approach its most equitable pact possible with capital. 
in which also, as I've said, the liberal idyll of redistributive democracy seemed within reach. It is a mythos that lingers on, even as for more and more people, its promise recedes into the realm of the unreachable, the unreal, the unrecognizable, and especially for rising generations, the unthinkable, which takes us back to realities present, into the present continuous, now nearly 50 years in the making, a present without foreseeable the no more. These past decades have seen the convergence of two processes that together have shaped the latest chapter in the relationship of capital and labor, and specifically the contradiction at its core. The first of these processes patently lies in the morphing planetary workplace, as the corporate center has rebuilt global commodity chains and with them its regimes of accumulation. Partly by reconditioning and recommissioning the structures of colonial extraction, partly by capturing post-colonial states, it has recalibrated many of its operations rendering mobile its sites of manufacture and its lines of distribution. Already in the 1970s, this was anticipated conceptually in what some Western economists called the new international division of labor, a realignment marked by the migration of proletarian jobs from the North to the South, primarily in res response to falling rates of profit, rising worker demands for better wages and various forms of deregulation. In the world still then known as the third, labor was much cheaper and less protected. It was also centered in major measure on the household, on kin, on ethnic ties, and on close social networks. Violent extractions at these edges of empire has always been the underside of the European romance with free labor. Here, everyday economic life necessitated a labor mix of subsistence and petty commodity production occasional contract work, migrant employment, and penny capitalism in the informal sector. And I'll be coming to this very centrally again in a moment. And as demanded creative credit management. These were and are the social ecologies in which rank poverty imposes on individuals and families, and especially women, the burden for diversified survival strategies, which perforce often include taking the lowest paid, most insecure, and most menial jobs available. No surprise then that it is in the formal colonies of the South to which both corporate capital and its rogue competitors, and think here things we know very well in Africa, blood diamonds, human trafficking, narco commerce, and so on, um, that th th they've turned um, to them in the quest to e extract optimal profits. Fabrication in these contexts tends to be reduced to its most elemental, to one operation in a supply chain paid minimally for each productive act and nothing else, and likely to move on abruptly if conditions favor doing so. In the age of the planetary labor market, writes Mark Graham, millions of jobs can now be done from almost anywhere on earth, even at the level of the micro task, enabling firms to take the advantage of or take advantage of a global reserve army on a per click uh, uh, basis, rather than even a per person basis. Employees in rural Central Africa, for instance, may toil in the most advanced tech industries, sometimes in open air factories, carrying out routine, repetitive and piecemeal tasks, like basic data recognition and classification that machines cannot yet perform. They are often told nothing about the productive processes of which they are one dispersed part, nor about the fact that the very work they are doing is likely soon to render them themselves redundant. In theory, adds Graham, flexible geographies of production should distribute jobs across the world. But in practice, these geographies exert a huge downward pressure on wages and working conditions everywhere. At the same time, they decimate labor markets in the North. And of course, this is where we see our own unemployment rising. Kaushik Basu, just one voice in a fast growing literature on globalization, work and inequality, refers to this effect of planetary articulation as labor linkage. The open air factories of the Central African countryside and the shuttered industria of the US inner city are tied integrally to one another, even when the ties that bind them drop out of visibility. 
What is more, post-colonial work continues to survive mechanization because some African workers remain cheaper even than machines. Even skilled workers may cost less to capital than their robotic, robotic replacement, as they do in African ports, notes Nina Silvanus, where in like say in Hamburg, crane operators have not been substituted by non-human solutions, at least not yet. Nonetheless, the formal employment market, even at its most abject sectors, has shrunk both in the North and the South. Here is where the second process comes into play dialectically. With the attenuation and casualization of so much of the labor force in the North, there's risen a lively facsimile there of the informal sectors of the South, all the more so with a fall in real wages and the capture of rising numbers of people, workers and post workers alike, in a life world of spiraling inescapable debt. The creeping informalization, um, this creeping informalization is being subsumed by, uh, partly by the growing gig economy, partly by other economies that are proliferating in inverse relationship to formal work. The sharing economy, the caring economy, the artisanal economy, the hospitality economy, the criminal economy, the intimate economy, the carceral prison economy. None of them either conventionally proletarian or regularly waged. All of them depend to a significant extent on commodifying the means of ordinary life, means once viewed in mainstream Euro America as beyond the market, but now treated as micro capital to be put to the purposes of accumulation. Focused on the household and more broadly the private sphere, informalization ruptures received lines between production and reproduction, male and female, work and leisure. And so the infrastructure and accoutrement of the domestic domain, bedrooms, cars, computers, phones, kitchens, dining tables, are turned into speculative assets, yielding income from their commercial deployment. Thus does everything and everybody become capital in prospect or in practice, everybody and everything the object of financialization, including most of all, as Foucault reminds us, the neoliberal self. Now, of course, import, informal enterprise has always existed, more or less overtly, in northern contexts, especially among the poor. But what has changed is the proportionate relationship um, in labor demographics to formal employment, alike blue and white collar, male and female. Also, the recognition of informal um, uh, employment as a vital part of the material, social, psychic and ethic life and their reappropriation through platform business and algorithmic capital back into the formal sectors that spun them off with real socioeconomic consequences. Now, this last thing, platforming, on which there is now a burgeoning literature, covers a wide spectrum, much of it involving the financialization of informal activities, activities with a long history in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. At one end are the giants like Uber and Airbnb, which upscale and techno-rationalize ride and room sharing, i.e. petty rental arrangements, similar to those that arose among colonial urban populations and live on today. We all know um, from the work we've done in Africa that people share their homes, pick up people along the road. That kind of sharing and petty capitalism has gone on forever, but now it's become an ever more visible feature of the North. On a more modest scale, for example, Japan's lively rent-a-family industry, epitomized by family romance, a company that building on traditional caring arrangements with analogs across the South, markets human affection and the comforts of home, supplying faux kinship to its clients. Its business model has emerging parallels in the North, among them rentafriend.com in North America, whose services include parents for hire, we need them for rituals, for job interviews. Similarly, the explosion of peer-to-peer, -peer, PTP, lending, brokered by online firms, with their precursors in rotating credit groups across Africa or in Islamic finance. Or Feastly, that offers meals served in a cook's, the cook's own home, recalling African shabins, um, past and present, where migrant laborers socialize in the living rooms of a female host, who fuses the role of landlady, wife, and entrepreneur, and so on and on. 
In point of fact, platforming does more than merely reappropriate micro entrepreneurial labor. It kind of takes from the informal sector and takes hold of these things and manages them. While it may simulate enterprise, it also makes independent contracting very difficult and charges producers a rising percentage of their income. And those of us who know about Uber and its history and so on see this happening. Self-evidently self too, it renders murky, even erases the lines, um, legal, conceptual, moral, and material between the formal and the informal. Hard to tell these apart. To the degree then it, that informalization and its platforming are rapidly gaining ground in the North, where the sharing economy is given a positive cost benefit gloss for harnessing the excess capacity of personal assets, otherwise idled, Euro-America is coming to resemble the South, living its history, as Svetlana Alexeyevich said, in second-hand time. This, however, leaves a crucial question unanswered. The contradiction underlying the relationship between labor and capital, played out recursively over the centuries, may be manifesting itself structurally in the reorganization of the global workforce, its demography, geography, temporality, and materiality, and two, in a rearticulation of the lines between the so-called formal and informal economies. But how precisely is that contradiction making itself felt in the experiential and political fabric of everyday life in the present? Almost everywhere, to return to our overarching narrative, public discourse, primed by this mythology of the post-World War II years, speaks as though a waged population remains the norm. Labor um, as the prime basis of social value and human dignity and material uh, existence has not lost any of its fetishized hold. Ironically, while the age of work seems to have come to an end, observes Cedarstrom and Fleming in their book, Dead Man Working, Dead Man Working, um, a dark provocative reflection, uh, th this, this book is a darkly provocative reflection on the zeitgeist of our times. This, they say in this book, working has assumed a total presence. Everyone is obsessed with it, the more the jobs seem to be disappearing. Growing angst about worker precarity has heightened its psychic centrality. A compulsive preoccupation with employment drives mainstream politics and political manifestos visions of education and criteria of self-worth. Even in the finance sector, where value is accumulated by ever more abstract means and by distancing production ever more from the commodity and productive economy, um, there is a constant going back to this language of labor. So people in the finance sector talk about their work as trafficking in profits, uh, products, instruments, and bundles. They talk about their profits as earnings. They talk about their work as an industry. So even this abstract form of production keeps going back to these industrial metaphors to describe what it's doing. This is hardly surprising. Work is the primary means by which persons are integrated into society, economy, polity, and kinship, notes Kathy Weeks. It is a basic obligation of citizenship. And ethically, if not legally, Something to, it is seen to as, as almost a right. Uh, in many states, people assume the government owes them work, even although it's often not in the constitution as a formal right. Statesmen's every, statesmen everywhere speak in the promissory language of bringing back jobs. Donald Trump's notorious fixation with reviving the largely defunct US coal industry is symptomatic of this impasse between the idealization of blue collar production and the cynical decommissioning of that work under the sign of profitability. For their part, voting publics respond by taking these promises literally uh, and seriously. To be sure, whatever form it may assume, however it may metamorphize, the status of wage labor as a basis of species being seems to endure with almost sacred persistence. In the USA, remarks Derek Thompson, and I quote him, Industriousness has served as America's unofficial religion since its founding. The sanctity of work lies at the heart of the country's politics, economics, and social interactions. Similarly in Britain, says Joanna Biggs, where labor gives life meaning, when religion, politics, and, po and community fall away. Not only in these places, 
Decent jobs for its citizenry is typically portrayed as a critical function of the state everywhere. Hence the millennial prominence in government manifestos of returning people to work, despite the fact that it seems almost impossible to do so. On the other side of this contradiction is the popular perception that the end of work is at hand, never to be reversed. Already in the 1990s, the economist Jeremy Rifkin argued that worldwide unemployment would increase as information technology eliminated tens of millions of jobs. His book evoked some scholarly critique for its techno-determinism and its reliance on a rather reductionist idea of employment. But like Richard Sennett's account of changes in work and career at the hands of corporate re-engineering and Ulrich Breck's bleak vision of the demise of a work society, this vision has, has, uh, has resonated with a recurring American nightmare. That nightmare, underscored by the 2017 Kinsey Global Report, predicting the loss of 800 million jobs to robotics alone by 2030, has echoes in other countries as well. Fueled by a rush of recent books aimed at mass audiences, most of them apocalyptic in tone, it is epitomized by the spreading rust belt where the flight of industry, the technicization of what remains, and the eclipse of labor have left behind cityscapes dotted with boarded up stores, derelict homes, ghostly school buildings. These are all the cadavers um, left behind by socioeconomic breakdown and national decline. So you have these ruins that you have across the center of many uh, former industrial northern cities. Not that capital fails to find new possibilities in these ruins. As Matthew Sules has observed, it has turned decay into a kind of zombie urbanism, leveraging these ruins through financializations into revenant assets. Here too, it follows some below the radar business practices in the South, where informal entrepreneurs wrestle ravaged real estate into vibrant mercantile centers. So in the South, we've seen many ruined inner cities turned into new forms of enterprise. Like for instance, the cross-border traders who bring to life decommissioned buildings and devalued spaces and deserted sidewalks in downtown Johannesburg. And they've made them into bustling hubs for low-end no global commerce. So there's an informal uh, 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 global market in the ruins of the inner city in Johannesburg that's take, that takings amount to billions of dollars all in cash. And this informal market actually exceeds the takings of the largest shopping malls in Africa. So there's a kind of zombie rebirth of this business. As we would expect, the planetary geography of labor is more complicated though than this end of work uh, vision suggests. Some, some economists speak of the Luddite fantasy, insisting, not without controversy, that new technologies tend to realign existing labor markets, often with positive effect rather than merely destroying them. They produce new jobs. And of course, many people do still toil in the manufacturing and service industries, both in the North and South. And with ongoing shifts in the ecology of production, new jobs are created, all kinds of new work emerges with technicization. The low official unemployment figures for most Euro-American nation states to be deconstructed in a moment, make this plain even if they do not speak to the nature of those jobs or the fact that many of them fall way short of actually yielding a living income. Yet this hardly accounts for or vitiates the existential, existential dislocation, the capricious trade off in lives, careers and futures that is, a, is caused by this radical reorganization of work. Witness the felt effects across the world of casualization, outsourcing and mechanization of the polarization of employment markets within and between nations and with the reduced quality of so many waged jobs. Hence this book, Dead Man Working. It evokes precisely the fear-inducing zombification with which we began. The fear that intelligent machines are changing the name of the game forever. This is exacerbated by the fact that they've already invaded some of the most creative intuitive professions uh, that exist from medical diagnosis to time, criminal detection to even musical composition. Many of this work is actually done by machines now. Some scholars also point to the fate of horses 
once seen to be second only to humans, here homo sapiens, in their indispensability to material production and economic progress. It seemed we could do nothing without the horse and suddenly the horse was redundant. No species, it seems, is immune from the quest at the core of the culture of capitalism, which ultimately, as I said, is to free production from the costs and constraints of labor. Remember here those horse people in Boos Riley's film that I mentioned, post-humans designed to be cheaper and more efficient than robots. Nonetheless, the compulsions behind the relentless effort to replace human workers with surrogates is not reducible simply to, to economic reason or cost-benefit analysis alone. John Seabrook's account of the avid, expensive, yet, yet fruitless push to develop a smart device to pick strawberries in the US reveals the complex socio-political forces that intersect with what might otherwise appear to be mechanical inevitability. The urgency to perfect a robot picker, Seabot, as Seabrook explains, is the effect of, the sh of a shortage of the right kind of labor. All over the world, it is migrants, the most abject and discounted and displaced workers, those often accused of, of stealing the jobs of nationals, who do agricultural work, they pick the fruit often under conditions of virtual enslavement. And that work is so degraded that often citizens will not do it. But contrary to the populist presumption, um, advanced industrial states driven by other obsessions have been ever more successful in curbing immigration in recent years, which has fueled the felt need for a technical solution uh, to this problem, because there are often not enough people to do these kinds of jobs, despite the fact that we are feeling invaded by, by immigrants. Meanwhile, despite vast capital investment, it is proving difficult to make machine hands that can replicate the speed and stamina and, dis and discernment of these low skilled workers. Yet rather than address poor wages or abuse of treatment in the industry, industrial leaders prefer to eliminate pickers altogether, albeit at mounting cost. This has its own measure of irony because a union leader of the fruit pickers uh, in California recently remarked that the workers themselves have been turned into kind of mechanical beings like robots, subjected to ever more uh, a demand uh, for, for work beyond the re recognition of their human condition. But this all simply underlines the question, how at this historical moment is the contradiction, uh, putting the ideology and the centrality of work against the perception of its need and its, its, its end, how is this reconciled in popular perception? At one level, work seems to be dis disappearing. We don't need it. At another level, we are terrified of its disappearance. The answer lies in several things of which we can offer just a glimpse here. The first is to be found not in its reconciliation at all, but in the empirical uh, 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 erasure at the behest of formal economics, specifically the occulting of the reality of the work situation uh, by the use of figures. Put it this way, if, a if in a population, a significant percentage of those who lack jobs are meant to disappear, if they are discounted, the remaining proportion, those with jobs, may appear much larger. Under these conditions, there is no army of the unemployed to worry about, nor does the end of work seem imminent. Per contra, full employment looks to lie um, on this side of the horizon of possibility in public policy. We can still think back to the 60s and think it's possible. Thus to sustain the dignity of labor, the wage and the mythic basis of the good life. In the USA, for example, the official jobless rate hovers at 4%, conjuring the illusion of an almost fully employed population. But this only takes into account those who are positioned to look, uh, to look for work and are actually doing so. It ignores entirely the employment population ratio which embraces everybody of working age who could be working but is not. That ratio stands at only 60.3%, which means that 40% of the adult American population with predictable sociological kind of profiles, people of color, low educated and so on, are not in wage jobs. Likewise in the UK, when where unemployment is much higher than the official account, and when me many people are radically underemployed, or have given up even looking for work. Note in this respect that workers on flexi time 
part-time or zero-hour contracts make up 39% of the entire EU workforce. Note also employment rates in, in Euro America that count people, all of these people who are doing minimally work, even if you've got one hour contract a week, you count as fully employed. This includes anyone who does paid labor for an hour or more a week, a fact that grossly inflates the employment rates. And this is not to mention wage, that, that wages have fallen further in the past decade than ever in recorded history. And this again marks out that there's a significant gap between having a job and being able to have a livelihood. If Investopedia is correct, an average wage earner in London needs 1.6 jobs, 1.6 jobs to survive minimally. In New York, that number is even higher. Striking teachers in Kansas, the state of Kansas um, in, in the US, recently reported needing three jobs to make ends meet. The self-employed who serve the myth of rosy employment figures earn even less than those in paid jobs. Another case this of hiding the predicament of contemporary labor and its structural demography in occult enumeration so that it makes the phenomenon appear. It's if once workers are both working and not working, they're present and absent. Much the same story could be told of many other European nation states. The real counts from the global north, whatever they actually may be, seem to be edging southward. They look much more like the figures we're used to in Africa when you take away these deceptive modes of counting. Another closely uh, related way of disappearing the paradox is to define labor so broadly as to, in place any, to, to embrace any form of socially productive activity, be it paid or unpaid, formal or informal, licit or illicit. This is what the 2018 European Commission on the Future of Work does in recognizing unpaid exertions as deserving the dignity classically associated with wage labor. Traditional concepts of work, it says, echoing feminist critiques of the 70s, must take a much broader array of non-standard employment into account, including unpaid contributions to our society. Thus is the burgeoning informal economy of caring and sharing, artisanal, cultural, even criminal labor, uh, assimilated into the new normal of the North, as it has long been in the South. Thus too is the paradox of work and non-work annulled conceptually by including almost anything into the category of value producing enterprise and asserting thereby the sustained theological centrality of work at the core of human beings. States can claim as they are in the US right now that the employment figures before the onset of COVID were better than they'd ever been, but more and more people were un unable to earn a living. For the disemployed and those pushed into the informal sector, what afflicts them is taken to be the sheer misfortune of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's not a structural thing. It's just that you were in Youngstown or Flint or in the coal towns of Kentucky or the silent shipyards of Glasgow or the factory shuttered cities of Northern England or other sites from which jobs have migrated or been replaced by machines. In some, while it may be reconciled or rendered invisible by the resort to false empiricism or misconception, the contradiction has not gone away between the fact that we want work, but we don't have work, neither structurally nor phenomenologically speaking. The present is less a moment of its transcendence than one with wrestling with its constant return. Wage labor remains at the ontological, the cultural, the value core of capitalism, of species being, under its political theology, of our conceptions of time and value, and of the unstable ratio between creation and destruction, even as wage work is said to be terminally endangered at its historical end, giving way to ever more abstract financialized forms of work and accumulation. Or, as we've offered instead, as it recedes, changes character and takes refuge in other economies, formal and informal, in the murky and unmarked spaces in between. Hence the mass anxiety that keeps reappearing in these schizoid figurations of labor, living and dead, the zombie is a worker and a non-worker, present and absent, human and post-human. The zombie, the specter, um, lacking species being, in robots made to look like people and people made to act like robots, 
in mutant multi-species workers of all kinds. Hence, too, more pragmatic modes of, attend, of addressing that anxiety, such thing as, things as the populist call for job creation, the increasing, if contested, campaign across the world for basic income grants as a right of citizenship, and most of all, the pursuit of a politics that may conceive of capitalism after labor, or better yet, towards a world of productive new forms of life and laborhood, of, of, of life and, and, and livelihood of labor after capitalism. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, Philip, we cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Oh, okay. So I said uh, thank you very much, Jean, for this rich and very important, somehow also rather depressing <laughs> analysis uh, in many ways. But uh, of course, recently many others, including uh, you referenced him, uh, David Graeber, in his bullshit job uh, book, but also Tanya Murray Lee and, and Jim Ferguson, for example have pointed to the ways in which the very nature of uh, labor and wage work um, has radically transformed and how the, the proper job is threatened with disappearance after what they call the century of laboring men, um, <clears throat> as Ferguson and Lee called it. But, but your, your analysis is much more encompassing and uh, you go much further in that you describe um, that, that contradiction, how wage labor, in spite of its end, remains uh, the ideological and the ontological core of capitalism. And, uh, and you, you, you point out how the, the old contradictions underlying that relationship uh, between labor and capital manifest themselves structurally, as you say, uh, in the reorganization of the global workforce, pragmatically in a redrawing of the lines between formal and informal economies between North and South, therefore. And, uh, and towards the end, you also uh, focus on how this contradiction makes itself felt in the, on the experiential level and the, the, the political fabric of everyday life. And that, of course, is a perspective that brings us to uh, the central focus of the Anthusia project uh, that uh, uh, fares under the, the, the flag of human security. Uh, I suspect that you would interpret that vocabulary that the EU now also adopted and not by coincidence, they're funding this project as yet another, as yet another way of uh, obscuring perhaps and rendering invisible uh, the contradiction by redefining labor and uh, the right to labor so broadly as to uh, embrace any form of socially productive activity, as you pointed out, uh, this time under the umbrella of security. But given all this, where then I, I wonder lies uh, a, a possible way out of this new mm -hmm. old uh, capitalism that your analysis seems to be so omnipresent and so tentacular that uh, there does not seem to remain much space to... Um, uh, to think counter-hegemonically or to, to generate alternative outsides of, of uh, the, the, this all-encompassing capitalist yeah. system. So all the dynamics that one could think of as alternatives, and I was while I was reading your text, because I've had the benefit of, of reading a, a draft, um, but so all these alternatives, the care economy, the share economy, and so on, uh, you, you, you name them all, but... Um, uh, you say, well, all these forms and, 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 and sorts of, of occupation are nothing new, and, uh, and in your reading, they merely uh, offer returns of all the forms of exploitation and financialization in, in rebranded romantic or sentimentalist uh, uh, guys. Uh, so that too doesn't leave a lot of space for hope, let's say. Um, and given this, I, I, I wonder what uh, uh, in our far more radical 
uh, or systematic attempt at, at incorporating a southern perspective beyond the, the main the, the, the south's contribution of informalization to the rest of the world uh, how would that 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 more radical southern perspective would that enable would that be able to offer an opening and in what what way um, i think uh, i do not only mean the possibility that categories such as wage labor and also class perhaps rather than disappearing uh, continue to be reconfigured also differently in the global south uh, and yeah. thereby help to reflect uh, differently on the nature of, of wage labor take for example the informal economy uh, we, we yeah. tend to think of, of that as uh, as uh, as a form of self-employment but i think there's a lot of wage labor within the informal too and so um so there's that and simultaneously we, we we have also seen the emergence of a, a recent and very uh, vibrant anthropological literature uh, in which class takes center stage again uh, to analyze the heterogeneity of current labor uh, conditions in a continent such as Africa uh, much of that literature I would say uh, situated somewhere between E.P. Thompson and Bourdieu uh, and I'm gesturing yeah, yeah. to Nina Wormer's uh, recent work makes a plea for the, the use of a more uh, multidimensional or relational or positional concept of, of class in order to capture differently uh, the complexity and heterogeneity of labor relations. But apart from all of that, uh, how would you say a certain perspective could help us to reach beyond uh, the central contradiction at the heart uh, of, of your analysis uh, beyond that as you say in the last lines of of, of the text at least uh, might lead towards a world productive of new forms of life and uh, livelihood and of labor after capitalism so what what would that beyond um, look like i don't i don't know if there's such a thing as after capitalism if that is at all possible at this point but uh, could the beyond possibly lie in a radical um, reconfiguring of the notion of the the Faber, the, the homo Faber itself uh, of making uh, mm. not to move towards the, the the world once imagined by someone like constant Niebuhr with this new babylon uh, the, the, that utopian city where the homo ludens would uh, the, the creative men would would replace the working men uh, but uh, but to evolve towards a world where Faber and making tinkering uh, uh, smitting uh, um, is, is returned to its more creative um, dimension so and again you, you might you might say it's too romantic or too sentimentalist but would for example do it yourself urbanisms uh, uh, maker and hacker movements uh, that are springing up both in the global south and the global north uh, would they constitute such a beyond or uh, are they well just mere acts of piracy or, or parasit parasitic uh, uh, activities uh, too completely encapsulated by the system to, to, to pose a problem to it, or even as they pretend to hack it or to, to infuse it with an alternative ethos. So turning to the, the word future in, in the title of your talk, not in the, the, the paper itself, but uh, I guess my question would be about the futurity that, 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 is, uh, that you gesture at, uh, uh, whether in that, in that future one might conceive of uh, a different way of what constitutes work and, and value, uh, perhaps not so much thinking uh, forward within the framework of labor as the as the, the telos of, of capitalism but uh, but more by by thinking sideways rather than forward uh, in a decentered way uh, about work through an anthropology of work as you say through ethnographies of, of what what work is what the difference is between labor and work or uh, what what uh, of the ethnographies of what works and 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 what might work out uh, so that's perhaps the, the the question that i have for you wow <laughs> would you like me to also do we want to take from the from the more general audience Lotte? well i think jean should we take a couple of questions 
uh, to bring in more voices and then um then thanks so much Philippe. you're welcome i hope you've written them down yes i'm reading them here from um mm -hmm. from the q a session so um let's start with a with a question from teke um he is saying thanks a lot for this thought-provoking presentation gene I just wanted to come back to the issues you raised around the public discourse on wage earning population yes. as a lingering norm, and on this especially visions of education. There has been a lot of debate recently in several Western countries and even beyond about the relevance of university education in the arts and humanities with a major argument being the questionable relevance of these fields of studies in terms of creating employment and contributing to economic growth compared to, for instance, the STEM fields. Wow. In light of this, so he has two questions now. Can you please unpack a bit more um, your views on the role of universities in shaping and challenging this waged employment as the norm? That's the first question. And the second one is, how will you situate the role of universities normatively in this labor and capital symbiosis? Do you want to go with that or do we want to take more? Do you want a couple more? Well, maybe we could take that and, and Philippe's together because there's quite okay. a lot in there. Yeah. And Philippe, I hope you've written those down. I'd love to have them. Uh, it, it's very interesting, Teke, that you raise this question, if I can start with that, because in fact, at this very moment, um, as the COVID crisis, and um, let me just say something about that because I haven't mentioned it. The, the, the pandemic has kind of brought things into a sort of visibility now where many of these contradictions and tensions have been laid bare. And one of them, uh, very starkly, uh, at least here in the US, and I know in South Africa too, uh, has had to do with the role of the university. Uh, universities have, have not, uh, are not only closed in many places, and we are communicating, if at all, by Zoom, but, but they have been, have, have been cast into all kinds of financial stringency. So the question of what becomes urgent, what becomes necessary, what is prioritized, the move back to austerity, has been one of the reflex kind of gestures. And this is particularly the case where universities are private, maybe less in, in state universities. But for instance, right now, it's just been announced that there'll be no further graduate uh, intake in anthropology for the moment here. Um, and, 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 and art history and a series of things that clearly draw a line between what is seen to be education maybe for, for the kind of moral citizenship, but not for direct employment or for immediate utility. There also right now is a, a struggle going on within the universities here about the fact that even before the COVID crisis, there was a sense that at least in many fields other than STEM, uh, that, that there was really no future in university employment and that there was a generational line being drawn between the generation that came, you know, born indeed of that 60s period that I was talking about when there was a vast expansion of universities and the present, where there's a much more stringent utilitarian view uh, of the luxury of an education for life, which was what so much of university education was designed to be, particularly at the undergraduate level, was not so much about producing people uh, for direct employment or utility or even for information technology. It was about the creation of citizenship, the idea of the kind of cultured philosophical role of a certain sort of educated sector of the society. And this has increasingly been thrown in question, not least, uh, by the tech revolution that in some parts of the US is saying now, the whole idea of university education is a luxury we've got to rethink because the real problems, the real skills, even the answers to some of the most philosophical and value oriented questions like who should work and what, these things can be solved uh, much more by technical means, by the kinds of sampling, by the kinds of reflection, by the kind of uh, mode of thinking that the tech uh, sector is, is producing, right? So the whole idea of the future of the university is very much up for grabs, right? And, and there are parts of the US now that are identifying universities um, with, with what is a continuation of a kind of Eurocentric, if you like, elitism, uh, 
um, they're institutions that pretend to an expertise that 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 uh, de devalues the kind of qualities of another section of the of, of the population. So the usefulness of a university um, and 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 its its role in 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 thinking in creating a space beyond uh, the urgency of of production and and the the reigning uh, ideologies of the moment to be think to be critical. To, this is very much in question in much of the world and universities in many places are endangered institutions. So that, and, and that moves back to what, um, I think some of what Philippe was asking as well, is the question of how we think our way beyond this impasse that we're talking about um, here and, and, and what kinds of futures are, are, are envisionable uh, on the basis of this kind of, as you say, somewhat pessimistic analysis. Look, in some ways I see this as pessimistic, yeah? um, and, 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 and in other ways, I think that what we see, if we look carefully at the histories of the South and see, for instance, uh, the, the rise of informal economies, of the kind of creative multiple ways in which people make a living that, that cut across the, the simple idea of the public and the private, the world of the work, the world of home, you know, uh, the, the world of money um, as against the world sometimes of barter, uh, the informal economies um, that we tended to see in the North as the kind of rogue pre-modern or not fully modern, the kind of not, uh, if you like, viably rationalized forms of trying to imitate capitalist modernity that we really need to bring under control because they, they, they drag back growth, they need to be formalized, they're part of that second economy that will never allow real economic takeoff, that will not allow proper accumulation, they're not sustainable. Those worlds, in fact, if you focus on them, have produced other modes of livelihood yeah, that involve uh, a much less clear-cut line between, for instance, kinship and the workplace, between work and leisure, uh, between the ways in which you make a living and enjoy sociality, between the market cultures that we know in Africa, where markets are places of sociality, they're places of a certain amount of, 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 of profit-making, often the the, the, the gains are relatively marginal because there's much more human infrastructure, their notions of debt that are not simply about immediate financialization. I, there's a mode of life uh, that, 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 that is more sustainable than I think we've allowed um, when our formal economic novel, models look um, beyond the, role of the realm of the formal economy. Right? And if you think about uh, the ways in which sustainability has existed, in, from the colonial period onwards in Africa, uh, an engagement of what were pre-industrial or pre-capitalist modes of production with the market, with structures of, sta of the state, with institutions of a financialized sort, but yet not fully dominated by them. There are other modes of existence that I think that we need to take seriously. For instance, I do think that if in looking at the economies of Africa, we to see the creative, innovative, sustained dimensions that much of what we call the formal, informal economy, which is a huge span, uh, that involves institutions of various sorts, some of them financialized, some of them not, some of them, as you say, involving uh, quasi wages, some of them involving long term forms of debt that are much more tied up with forms of reciprocity and other kinds of community life. There are ways of thinking about economic survival there uh, that, 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 that are much more, if you like, uh, optimistic much more involved in sharing, much more involved in thinking about sustainability under conditions of scarcity and constraint than we allow for. So one of the things I think we need to do immediately is to, is, is to understand the way that these worlds are existing and have always existed and the complex connections between formal economies and informal, between modes of business, between uh, state economies, and these peripheries, as we call them, that are often not that peripheral, but are increasingly becoming modes of life in the North. So there are many things that we need to do. First of all, is to understand what we're looking at uh, in terms of what emerges as, 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 if you like, in the spotlight of the way we understand global economies and what's happening to work, and an honesty about the, what, what work has always been. That the idealization of the wage economy, and indeed the ideologies that go with it, the kind of Protestant forms of dignity, and civility and self-making that came with missionary institutions and were perpetuated after independence in Africa and defined certain things as dignified and respectable and other things as less so. We have to look at those things and, 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 and think about how 
they are constraining um, the ways in which we can think forward out of the contradictions of where we are. I guess I'm less a utopian thinker and a thinker about the outsides, because I'm not sure that there ever are outsides right now of the forms of capital, but there definitely are uh, varying, if you like, periphery centers, modes of incorporation within it, modes of moving beyond it, at least partially. And we need to work from the contradictions within the system and understand them. For instance, right now, I think there are many experiments going on in the South, yeah, in places like Latin America. They've been stymied a little bit in Brazil because in fact, many of these experiments are threatening uh, to forms of capital and, and particularly neoliberal forms. But things that were going on in Brazil around redistribution, uh, new forms of, of social grants, new forms of, if you like, uh, Keynesianism, uh, that were occurring in the South because of the need to see that formal labor and self-production and the, and the takeoff of entrepreneurialism was never going to capture everybody. Right? So for instance, in much of Africa, debate about basic income grants, you know, the ways in which social grants work and social welfare operates, you know, the banking of people who are not formally bankable because in fact, they're in the informal sector. There are a variety of ways, yeah. Jean, actually, we have we, we have so many questions. We go, have go ahead. answers, but there is a question, particularly about basic income grants. Yes. Can we take? Can we move on to that? Yes, absolutely. Um, from Cecilia Bunn, one of our Anthusia PhD students, she also says thanks. It's been you know a very rich presentation. Um, you alluded towards. Um, at the end of your presentation, and we would, I she would like to ask you if you have any reflections to share regarding recent experiments in Europe and Southern Africa and basic yeah. income grants. Mm -hmm. And if I can, can can I read another one? Because I know that oh. you, um, another question is not quite related to to this. And yet again, from Victor Kova, he says. For Marx, but also for revolutionary Marxists like Rosa Luxemburg, capitalism yeah. designated the crisis of bourgeois society yes. under the Industrial Revolution, leading to both underwork and overwork, out automation and sweatshops. For both, the crisis showed the potential for a refoundation of bourgeois society beyond wage labor in a way that would benefit from rather than be undermined by the industrial revolution. <clears throat> this convinced millions of people all over the industrialized world to pursue the overcoming of capitalism in the first half of the 20th century. Such an emancipatory potential seems absent from your analysis as from the new left theorists like Foucault you've relied on. Why would you say that is? So maybe we can stay with these two um, questions. Sure. There are many, many more if you want to, we'll try and, and keep them, but we also have to keep time. Of course. Look, the basic income grant is a very interesting question because it goes to the heart of some of the things that Philippe was talking about as well. The idea of basic income, you know, the re redistribution that recognizes the reality that we're not going to move in, in any immediate sense beyond capitalism, you know, Zizek and Harvey and people have said it's easier to think about the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Right? And so uh, the point that I am, am, am and, and I think basic income grant folks, Jim Ferguson and others are recognizing is that we're not necessarily going to get beyond capitalism, but from within it, uh, we find various kinds of ways of working creatively, if not to transcend it, but to change its face. And that's in part also a question, an answer to the second question, uh, in that indeed the, the, the degree to which capitalism yeah, has become, has, has, has invaded and commodity forms have invaded the very fabric of the world that we in, inhabit, it's ex increasingly difficult to think about organizing uh, along the basis of the way that we did in labor movements and revolutionary movements in the first half of the 20th century. Not least is the fact that capitalism now is a global phenomenon, the division of labor is global. And it's therefore difficult in some ways to think about how we reorganize national economies and national solutions. The basic income grant is one of the ways of trying to think about this, right? is to say, look, there will always be production, but there will always be people that are rendered increasingly yeah, 
workless, if not wageless. Now that raises a whole series of questions because work is not simply wage work. And that's too much to be trying to get into at this, at this moment. But the idea of the basic income grant is to recognize that there are engines of production and there are places of redundancy. And what you do then is to try and seek, uh, to see that people who are even uh, workless and wageless, the very conditions of their redundancy are also the conditions of profit that are being produced by a national economy and therefore they have a right to a share. Now, part of the basic income grant, I think many of us find, you know, sort of uh, beyond question, some kind of redistribution, and this is another point to go back to Philippe, you start where you are. The most immediate thing now is that there are people who, who, who cannot live. And so redistribution, the kind of thing you're seeing here in the American economy, try and recreate the new deal, some form of redistribution. Basic income is one of them. I have strong feelings about basic income because I think in some ways, more carefully uh, uh, targeted grants of the sort that you find in South Africa around specific kinds of things, unemployment, yeah, uh, uh, child needs, illness, uh, a more nuancing, if you like, of what the state gives rather than a flat basic income grant, I think is, is likely to be more productive in the long run. But those forms of redistribution are important. They run up against one key problem, and that's at the center of what I'm talking about here. Many people feel that simply to get basic income grant is undignified in the sense that the significance of work, uh, the role even of the masculinized wage laborer is something that stands in the way very often um, of, of the, 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 the ability to simply see that the money that would come with the basic income grant is part of your legacy, that you indeed have not earned it in the sense of doing a formal job, but your very history, your presence in a place and time is part of what's contributed to the wealth of the place. Right? And this is where ideas like reparations, other kinds of ways of thinking about how people have contributed to the wealth of a society and economy, and therefore have a, a share due to them, a rightful share, but that it's not tied to the rather literal idea of work that still obtains in many, many places. Um, it's often very gendered, uh, it often has to do with very particular ideas of labor. Now, I'm not saying that that should stand in the way of basic income, but I do see that the contradiction that many people have found, even working in South Africa around you know, ideas of basic income and looking at the way people respond to the possibility, it runs up again and again to this idea of the laboring person and the dignity of self-making through work. So redefining what dignified work is, is one of the most important things. And the interesting thing about the informal economy is that these things are often much more flexible. That, that producing through you know, domestic contexts where people produce food and sell it on the roadside or have people come into your home breaks down the distinction of what constitutes work uh, as against leisure, uh, what constitutes you know, viable expertise as against ordinary making money out of the, the, the activities of everyday life. So there are ways in which we can rethink, I think, profoundly uh, that idea of work uh, and its relationship uh, to the mainstream wealth in the society, the formal and the informal, that, that begin to attack from the grassroots basis some of these really philosophical questions. You know, for instance, if you're making money by selling hospitality, you are both making yourself as a social person. You know? Often when people do this, they sit together in a place, they're doing handwork, you know? they're talking, they're contemplating, they're doing critical kind of you know, gossip work in the community. And there's a whole complex mode of being there even the exchanges in the informal economy are never as immediate and direct that they simply constitute payment. They often are the kinds of exchanges, they create a human infrastructure, they often are very communal. So I'm not to romancing these forms, but I think there are various ways in which the things we're talking about, basic income, you know, where you look to for transformation, where the relationship between the, the tight notion of capitalism and its forms of constraint, the commodity relationship, the reduction, of life to those forms and it's undoing. They can exist and they coexist in many communities where in fact forms of production are much more multiple yeah? and, and, and relationships to time and, 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 and communal membership and so on are much more complex than we allow. We often as anthropologists, when we describe work and economies, look only at the formal dimensions of work um, and, 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 and ignore the much more complicated ways in which Formal wage labor exists in a nexus of much more informal uh, modes of producing, exchange, and so on. And that this could enable us to get a much more complicated view of the way in which people actually exist in relation to capital on the one hand, 
kinship on the other, uh, leisure, community membership, and so on. But I do think in all of this, basic income or its equivalent, forms of social distribution, uh, uh, um, what are it used to be called welfare, you know, the, the modes of, of a kind of Keynesian sharing are absolutely essential. And we have to begin with those practical things. And along with them, other kinds of forms that go along with this. For instance, labor unions, forms of collective kind of work oriented uh, um, um, organizing politics, but also pressure you know, on forms of um, economy, distribution, uh, critique, policy, and so on. Wow, Jean, thank you so much for all these very rich answers to questions. And there are so many more questions here. And I'm afraid we're running short of time, but we are going to keep those really interesting questions about horses and Uber drivers and Trump elections. <laughs> and yeah, there are so many. We're going to, to keep them and actually send them to you because they might be interesting um, for later on. And I hope we can keep them in our discussion during this um, summer school uh, and maybe maybe get back to them if we get a chance to, to, to talk to you again. But I want to thank you so much for being willing to give this lecture, engage in this um, discussion. I also want to thank Philip for acting as our discussant and, uh, you know, putting, putting Jean to work. 